for uh, altering your schedule and, and uh, joining today. So th this to me is, is a very exciting and important uh, discussion. And then when I was there, we only did a couple of, of enteric feeding type things. I'm not sure how many have come up uh, since then, but sometimes you know, we are the ones who need to, as with so many other things that we do, we need to be the ones who initiate the idea, hey, maybe this person can have a tooth, or maybe this person can have this. So the more aware of these things you, you are, the more uh, likely you are to, uh, to help convey this information to the uh, referring physicians. Okay, so just as a brief overview, let's just talk about the rationale of feeding, a bit about the history types of tubes, insertion techniques, complications, and, and troubleshooting. So it should cover most things there. All right, so first off, here's my first introductory quiz. So this is a CT scan. You're, you're scheduled to read CTs one day, and you come across this image. What, uh, what do you think is going on, and what would you do? What? What what do you think about this image? Oh, I can see the tube, I mean, crossing the pyrolus into the first part of the duodenum. So is the tube in the right spot? Is the, does, does the tube look appropriate? Is there anything you're concerned about? Actually, the tube is in the first part of the dead numb. Just the, at the... Okay. So what, what would you tell, so again, what, what are you worried about? Or would you just read this? Feeding tube is in place. It's in the duodenum. Next case, or would you would you call someone? Are you worried about something? Is this normal? Is this are you? Is there something wrong here? I think if it is a ga I mean ga gastric feeding too, it is in the duodenum, so it is. Uh, you have to pull it back to the to the gastric fan, I mean gastric antrum. Well, so you can feed patients directly into the duodenum. I mean, as we'll talk about later, there's, there's different types of foods. There's gastric feeding and there's duodenal, duodenal feeding. So it, it's okay to feed into, into, into the structure beyond the, the stomach. It's important to know where the tube is to help decide, you know, how fast the feeds go. Um, okay, so so the issue with this, so you identify correctly. So here's the balloon that's distended with uh, water as it should be, but as you said, the balloon is in the, the duodenum, and so the duodenum is really only about that size. So in fact, this patient was constantly vomiting because they had gastric outlet obstruction. So immediately you look at this and say, okay, the tubes intraluminal but it's in the duodenum it's causing obstruction so as you you did kind of say too gently perhaps so you need to pull the tube back to reposition it or if you really wanted to you could leave it here and leave the feeds here but you need to then deflate the balloon or reduce the volume of the balloon so that you you reduce avoid the gastric outlet obstruction okay all right so you can always need to be thinking about these things Okay, so why do we place feeding tubes in people? So it's generally accepted that enteric feeding is better than TPN. I mean, what we commonly see here is, oh, someone can eat, they've got a problem, let's just put them on TPN. But TPN is expensive, TPN is complicated, TPN requires venous access. People like eating, people like feeling full by having food in their stomach. And there is much better positive nitrogen balance. So enteric feeding is important. So a little brief history about enteric feeding. So the first surgical gastrostomy done in 1876, first endoscopic 
II placed in 1979, and the first radiologic fluoroscopic guided tube placed in 1981, T2 fa T fasteners first used in 96, 86, and then the first radiologic placement of, of, a, of a peg type tube in 1999. So here's just uh, one of the early articles, which I, I show you for a couple of reasons. One, just to, to show. So in 1985, uh, this was published. And, and I'm proud to say that this was published in Canada. So C.S. Ho was one of my mentors. I work with him. And he, this group is, is Canadian, Robin Gray and Morris Goldfinger. I work with, and Irv Rosen. I work with all of them. And, uh, and CSO is actually one of the, the big Canadian leaders in, in uh, GI interventional radiology. So it's nice to know that uh, again, something came from Canada here. All right, so second uh, quiz type question. So uh, gastric or gastric gentinostomal feeding tubes, can, uh, can someone give me a number of indications? Give me a list of reasons why we would place these tubes. Uh, indication for gastric feeding tube. First, yeah. maybe, maybe if patient has a esophageal tumor. Okay. Uh, has a esophageal neurological deficits. Uh, for jejunal tube feeding, Maybe a patient, um, if patient has a gastric outlet obstruction, but functioning the GI system. Uh, and others for parenteral feeding. I mean, for medications, for Okay, so so that's good. So it, it it's a it's a basically it's for reasons that so people can't eat. So why can't someone eat? They can have malignant obstruction either of the head and neck, the esophagus, the mediastinum. So in our practice, this is actually one of the most common things: neurologic impairment. Someone's had a stroke. Someone's got a motility disorder. Someone's got dementia and and can't remember to eat or doesn't eat enough. Uh, facial trauma or, uh, or for the use of decompression and someone who's got malignant obstruction, we can place a tube to decompress the, the, the GI tract in order to avoid having a long-term nasogastric tube. All right, very good. So the common thing that, that occurs, at least in our hospital, is the first and simple thing they can't eat, they place a nasogastric tube, so, and then, you know, I'll be say, oh, it's easy to speed the NG tube in instead of putting in a peg. But this is interesting, actually. So if you look at patients with strokes who had a peg or nasogastric tube, the mortality of a peg is significantly less. The albumin increased more, and they were discharged home more frequently. In fact, none of the patients with NG tubes were discharged home by six weeks. So. Uh, moving quickly towards placement of a percutaneous feeding tube is, is very valuable to patients. And we all know that longer term nasogastric tubes causes problems. It causes irritation and potentially infection. So again, it's important to think about these tubes and think about these tubes early in, in someone's course. So what are the types uh, of, of tubes, where can they be? So we just, as mentioned, nasogastric, nasogenital. So say someone, you know, a 25 year old with Crohn's disease who maybe has got an acute exacerbation or someone with, with pancreatitis, we wanna get beyond the DJ flexure. So radiologically, it's easy for us to, to guide a feeding tube to the nose and, you know, for temporary purposes into the digenum. Then in terms of uh, placing percutaneous tubes, we can place a tube directly from the skin into the stomach, gastrostomy. We can place a tube directly through the skin into the stomach and then feed it into the jejunum, gastrojejunostomy. 
or we as radiologists actually can place a straight percutane insertion technique. So of course, you know, as we discussed, percutaneous, which is why we're here, endoscopy, which uh, in our hospital, our endoscopists have totally given up on it, or even the guys who still that anymore, because you know, if you are able to offer a service, a good service, then they're not going to have the need to, to do it themselves very often. So turf can often disappear. If you provide what the patient or what your referring physicians need, then you get all the business. So that's a great and easy way to grow your practice by, by being, say, aggressive and getting out there and saying, hey, we can do this and do it well. And then, of course, surgical. And in many of these patients, you really hate to have them undergo a surgical procedure. Many of them have advanced malignancy. Many of them have neurologic impairment. And if you can avoid surgery and place a percutaneous tube, then that's really better for everyone. Uh, so, okay, percutaneous endoscopic gastroscopy, just to kind of talk about that. So that's less expensive than a surgical procedure, but actually it does require two operators. It's associated with the risk of gastroscopy. And they're actually completely blind with respect to location of the, of the colon. What they do here is they put a scope in the mouth and then they shine the light along the anterior uh, gastric wall. Someone, the second operator looks at the light, puts their finger there, and then they puncture the, puncture the skin and then they, uh, grab a, a snare, a wire, and pull it out, and then pull a, a, a peg tube down. So as I say, one of the big problems is it does not locate the colon, which is an important factor that we'll talk about later. Radiologic placement, of course, as usually is, is, is as often is the case, is the cheapest, less expensive of all techniques. Very simply requires just local anesthetic and conscious sedation. Again, I'll keep harping on identification of the colon. It's really quite safe. And even with a completely obstructive esophageal tumor, I mean, the GI guys will often cause and say, oh, the, the esophagus is completely occluded. I can't get through. But with our small wires and catheters and, and techniques, we can almost always get through an esophageal tumor. Um, so, well, so we can get through an esophageal tumor. In the case of if we can't get through an esophageal tumor, how then would you distend the stomach and, and, uh, and perform this procedure? That's what it is. So come again, sorry, with the question. If uh, you can distend the... the... The question is, how would you distend the stomach if if, a, if an endoscopist or you can't get through an esophageal tumor with a scope or a catheter. So uh, is, in that case, if the, 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 if the nose is a patent, then through nasogastric tube, and then you inflate air. Oh, it's completely. Uh, for what I think you can, percutaneous, you can uh, locate the the gastric and do percutaneous incision and they inflate through the sheath or the needle and they inflate the air. Right. Okay, so there's two ways you can do it. So one is you can use um, carbon dioxide or, you know, we, I don't know what you guys do. When we do upper GI series, we'll often give these little gas granules, gas crystals that, that uh, distend the stomach for CTs and whatnot. So even with a, a supposedly obstructing mass, often the gas granules will still get a little bit of, uh, of gas into the stomach. So failing that, the other thing, as you just mentioned, is just using ultrasound guidance, you can puncture the, 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 uh, the, the decompressed stomach with just a small 22-gauge needle and then inject either CO2 or just air 
and then you can uh, inflate the stomach and then do the procedure from there. So again, even though the esophagus is obstructed, you, you can still be successful. All right, so percutaneous technique, the standard uh, rules apply to most things. So again, people use different uh, coagulation guidelines. These currently are our guidelines, INR less than 1.3, greater than 50,000. Of course, obtain consent. And in my consent, I include the fact that this procedure could result in a complication that results in bowel perforation, abscess, and the requirement for surgery. So in our practice, you know, informed consent and, and letting patients know what the risks are is important, of course. You want to have an empty stomach, so NPO for six hours, because if there is fluid, fluid, food, or debris in the stomach, that increases the risk of peritonitis during the procedure because food and debris can spill. Intravenous access is, of course, important, and we ask our patients coming from the floor, we ask the nurses and the doctors to prepare the patient by placing a nasogastric tube to save us a step in radiology. And, you know, conscious sedation is good. You don't need conscious sedation. I mean, on, on a good day, you know, I can do a G-tube in less than five minutes. And, uh, you know, many of these patients are, are unwell or, or weak. You know, you're giving conscious sedation to be sure that they're, they're safe and, uh, and stay still for you. But you can do it without if required. So again, this varies a little bit. So antibiotics, I think as I'll pick on ASA for a moment. So as is the antibiotic expert, she gave a journal called a little while ago. Um, should you use antibiotics prior to placing the feeding tubes? I, I think antibiotics is not a... Uh, some article they say that uh, pro, uh, antibiotics prophylaxis is not routine indicated unless the patient has features of infection. Yeah, so you're right. Um, so actually, I learned something while I was researching this talk. So I, for a, a, a standard, I'll call them a push tube, which is the standard way we do the procedures. You put a needle, a wire in, and then you push the tube in. Um, I've never given antibiotics, um, but what they did find was patients without antibiotics, in this study, that without antibiotics, 13% of people did get local infections and 0% with antibiotics. Now, the pull method that we'll talk about a bit later is a little bit different, and there is a much higher risk of antibiotics because you're pulling the tube through the mouth, and particularly in patients with head and neck cancers, the risk is higher. So we virtually always try to give antibiotics uh, for the whole type method. Uh, again, this is different. I, I still, in spite of this article, I still don't uh, give antibiotics prior to a standard g -tube. All right, so contraindications. Again, the standard kind of list that we might think about. Coagulopathy, previous gastrectomy. If they don't have a stomach, you can't put a needle into the stomach. Uh, diffuse infiltration of the stomach. Tumor, if the, the stomach is infiltrated, then you know, the, you're not going to have the normal muscular wall to contract, and so there's going to be an increased risk of, of, uh, of pericatheter leakage. Uh, ascites is a relative contraindication, and the, the way to get around this is to be sure to use the uh, T fasteners. Otherwise, there will often, first of all, there's an increased risk of peritonitis. And as well, there's often going to be pericatheter leakage of ascites. So it can become a, a real mess. And I try when I can to avoid placing feeding tubes in these patients. But as I say, as long as you and the patient are, are aware and do what you can to avoid it, then that's good. Overlying organs, sometimes the stomach is just not in a place where you can reach. It's, it's up high under the rib cage, the liver is overlying it, or the colon's overlying. So standard uh, percutaneous techniques. So here's the liver, here's the spleen. Again, as I keep mentioned, locate the transverse colon. Some people routinely will give oral contrast to the patient if they can take it, say the day before, to opacify the colon. Some people will place a rectal tube 
to inflate gas into the colon or, or, or contrast into the colon so you can see it. Uh, usually the stomach is, is below the liver or overlapping it. Uh, rarely the stomach will be below the colon. And some people will do this trans or mental approach. I have to say I've hesitated to do that because you know there are many blood vessels in, in the uh, in the omentum and, um, and I'm concerned about bleeding and it changes the anatomy. So I, I just say it's been unusual that I've seen that situation and you'd have to decide for yourself how comfortable you feel. So again, here, always, you know, look, the first thing you do when you fluoro is look and say, where is the colon? Where is the stomach? And there's really not, not a window here. So you have to say this is uh, technically not possible to do. Sometimes I would bring the patient to CT and see if there's a different window or see uh, if things look different on a different day. So what if you don't notice the colon? You go ahead, you just say, ah, oh, here, there's a great stomach. I'm gonna put a needle in the stomach and, and go ahead. What, what is the risk or what is the concern? Sorry, the question again, please. If you go ahead and do a procedure place a feeding to percutaneous feeding tube and you don't notice that the colon is overlying the stomach. Also, you could actually prepare the, the colon. Yes, then what happens? And then the patient ends up with a fistula and actually trigger peritonitis. Correct. So they may not necessarily actually get peritonitis, but they're going to get a fistula and that, again, is something that you really want to avoid. So again, in your checklist, you know, whenever you're doing any procedure or interpreting any study, uh, diagnostic imaging study, you always want to have a little checklist in your mind and say, now I'm going to look for this, now I'm going to look for that. And, you know, for the 20th time during this talk, as I'll repeat, look for the code. All right, excellent. So how do we do the procedure? So good gastric distension is, is critical. If the stomach is not well distended with, with gas, you're going to have a problem. So we like using, we actually use this, this little puffer ball for barium enema. So this is what I like using. It's, it's simple because you're not having to completely disconnect and reconnect uh, a, a syringe for individual inflation. So we just hook this up to the feeding tube and just puff air in a few small puffs. And it's uh, an easy way to extend the stomach. As I mentioned before, gas granules is, is an, another option. I have to say, I, I really don't typically use that, but it is an option. Other things, when I first started, we used to use a, a, say a paralytic type uh, agent to reduce the gastric mortality. I've stopped using that. Can you, is that Eric? Can you, yeah, okay. Um, I've stopped using this and I, you know, again, as long as you're washing the stomach and you're just bending the stomach, usually I find that's enough. Identify the liver with ultrasound, identify the colon with the contrast. So tea fasteners, uh, I've only recently started using. We've recently changed our tubes from the, the old, I'll call them the old style. You know, the abscess drainage catheters you use and the biliary catheters and the prostomies. Those are the tubes we used to use for, for feeding, uh, which are you know, small 12 French and, and easy to place, but there's been issues in Canada. And so they, they've stopped allowing those tubes being used. So now we're using 12, 14, 16, 18 French silicon tubes, which are softer and require a much larger uh, puncture. And because you're making a larger hole in the stomach, it often pushes the stomach away. So we use now these uh, tea, tea fasteners, which reduces the spill of the gastric contents. And as I said before, it's great with the CITES. So you put the tube, you put this in, and then it just uh, pulls the stomach up against the anterior abdominal wall. So it makes it easy to, to get a needle into it, get a tube into it without pushing the stomach away. So it's pretty simple. So here's, you put the needle in and then you just push the, uh, the needle comes preloaded. It's a special system. I, I suspect you've seen them. Uh, comes loaded with a little T fastener. You push it out and then there's a string that you attach onto the abdominal wall. And with the string eventually, the suture eventually dissolves. So you just place them, leave them and they will dissolve and fall off. 
So here's two, two T fasteners in place, and then you essentially just puncture in between them for your feeding tube placement. Uh, so again, as I said, we're using larger tubes, so serial dilatations of 20 French. And, and this is, you know, the second important factor here. So invagination of the anterior gastric wall by dilators can lead inadvertently to intraperitoneal tube placement. And if you don't notice this and you feed a patient into, this, into the peritoneum, uh, that is potentially fatal. So here are just some images. So here is the, the wire nicely in place, NG tube. Uh, here is a dilator. And you can see, if you look carefully, here's the gastric wall that's being partially invaginated. So, you know, I usually will tell my tech at that point, put a bit more air in and just keep watching what you're doing and be sure that you're pushing through the, the gastric wall and getting into the stomach. It's very easy to just push the whole stomach away from you, particularly without T-fasteners, or even with T-fasteners, sometimes if you're using a large tube, I've actually broken the T-fasteners, and even though you think they're there, they break and you can uh, push the stomach away from you. So here's you know, the standard peel-away sheath, which is pretty much essentially when you're placing these large, larger silicone tubes now. So this is what it looks like at the end. You've got your NG tube in, the two teeth fasteners, and here's, again, the old style tube. We used to use the, the standard Coke loop tube and position the distal stomach. It's actually a little bit distal for a gastrostomy tube. You really probably want to have the, the Coke loop here or even up there a little bit higher because as, as you just saw before, it's easy with peristalsis and migration for this tube to migrate in the, into, the, into the duodenum. And although in this case, there's not a balloon to cause gastric outlet obstruction, uh, you, know, you need to know where you're feeding. If you're doing the bolus large volume feeds into the stomach and you try and put that in the duodenum, you're going to cause vomiting and discomfort. So you don't want to do that. Uh, so percutaneous gastric digenostomy catheter is really pretty much the same thing. Again, locate the body of the stomach. So nice gastric distension. Here's a, a good puncture site somewhere around here. Uh, aim towards the pylorus. Uh, get a multi-purpose type catheter in, and then using uh, a glide wire, uh, get into the duodenum, and then get your wire. Then exchange for a nice stiff wire, and then place in this case like in one of the old style. Uh, polyurethane gastric gigantostomy catheter. So you can see, um, you know, here's the DJ flexure here. And so you've got nicely into, into the proximal duodenum. So this is a nicely placed tube. All right, so here is a patient 24 hours after a GGA tube insertion. Uh, any comments or concerns about this? Either yes or no. Do you see anything wrong? Are you okay? You carry on. So it's always important to look very carefully. So look at this, the Coke loop. Here's the stomach. Here's the duodenum. And here's the tube, the Coke loop. So this, this part of the tube, the, 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 the duodenal and, and gigantostomy portion of the tubes is in the correct position. But this part is out of the stomach. So this can be a problem because now the gastric wall isn't opposed to, to the anterior abdominal wall. So you can have leakage. And, and so this is not a good situation. So really, you need to reposition this tube. So our tubes are great. But uh, like everything in life, they're not always perfect. So radiological tubes are small. They block easily. Uh, they're easy to pull out. You know, the cope loop is flimsy, and even the retention balloons uh, often rupture. We, you know, on a regular basis, we've got a patient coming back to us. They bring their tube to us. They say, oh, well, here's the tube, and it's got a ruptured balloon, and it's falling out. So there's different kinds of tubes. So here's the, the standard tube. As I said, we used to use the cope loop tube that you're familiar with. And then there's this, I'll, I'll, I'll just call this a peg tube which is the, the typical tube that the gastroenterologists have historically placed. 
And these are great because they're big, they're 20 French, and they've got this fantastic bolster. This is just a piece of plastic. It's not a balloon. It can't rupture. So these are fabulous tubes that don't have to be replaced. The complication rate in terms of blockage and, and dislodgement is, is really quite minimal. So if I've got a patient who I know has dementia and is constantly pulling out tubes, I will aim to place this tube instead of our standard tube. So again, there's many different kinds of tubes, and these are the silicon tubes that were, we, we place now. So they've got this retention balloon, um, which as I say, can rupture. Uh, these are really nice tubes. So we, the, the kind of trade name of this is called a Mickey, Mickey low profile tube. So this is nice because there's not this long tube sticking out of someone. So it's le less interferes with someone's life, someone's life. And it's, uh, it's easy to replace. In fact, we tell patients or families, you can just replace this. If this falls out or blocks, you can just pop a new one in at the bedside. So when the tubes have been in for a long period of time and they fall out, there typically is a good track. And if the tube falls out and you, in the short term, uh, replace it, uh, these tubes are easy to replace, as I say, without needing a radiologist. So this is great for people who have difficulty getting to the hospital. Uh, and, and so we encourage these tubes and we do provide support and teaching to patients. And uh, uh, we, we like these tubes. Patients like these tubes. So here is this tube again. It's got a, a retention balloon. And these come in different sizes. So you know, for kids, we might use a, an 8 or a 10, and for adults, we might use a 18 or a 20. Um, now there's these fancy dual lumen tubes. So, so someone, as you had mentioned earlier, say has gastric outlet obstruction, then they've got two problems. They need enteric feeding, and they need to have their stomach decompressed. So we can place this percutaneous gastro jejunostomy tube so one lumen has these whole side holes in the gastric portion that can be used to decompress the stomach. And then it's got the distal lumen, distal hole in order to feed the patient. So these are, are great tubes that we less commonly place, but uh, certainly you need to think about them and, and they do have a very important role. So we talk about the Per oral, so those are the kind of the more standard percutaneous routes. And now there's the radiologic per oral gastrostomy, which combines the effectiveness of the radiologic procedure with the benefits of these, these great larger bolster tubes. So as I say, they're larger, less kinking, less blocking. And this is the same exact tube that the endoscopist used. But the advantage here is only one operator in comparison to the endoscopic placement. And so there's increased safety and increased uh, simplicity. So th this is a great procedure that uh, you guys should uh, consider trying. So as I say, I if I you know when I'm getting consent from a patient with dementia, uh, when I get the consent from their family member, I say, hey, does your father pull tubes out? And if the answer is yes, then I would place this tube. Or if someone's got recurrent problems with the standard smaller bowl tubes that keep blocking. The advantage uh, in terms of GJ tube is the jejunal tube feeding is a bit more difficult because you need a special J tube extension, which is it's nine French. It's smaller lumen than the standard GJ tubes we, we use. Uh, and as I said, there is perhaps some increased risk of procedural and related infection. All right, so how do we do this? So nicely distended stomach here. Is the NG tube. Here will be the puncture site. Instead of aiming towards the jejunum, in this case, I would aim towards the GE junction. So put a needle in, put a wire in, get a multipurpose catheter in. And usually we have too much difficulty with a multipurpose catheter and a glide wire, I like a stiff glide wire. You can usually select the, the esophagus and advance your wire and your catheter up the esophagus. There are times, of course, when you can't because of puncture site and anatomy. So in that case, I would use a snare, advance a snare typically through this, and then just snare the, the NG tube, and then have the, the nurse who's up at the head of the bed anyways, pull the NG tube back, and now you've got access to the, to the uh, 
esophagus. So here is access to esophagus, advance the wire, advance the wire, uh, find the mouth, advance the wire, uh, out the mouth, and then you have the nurse typically load the catheter on this wire. So you now have through and through access, the wires coming out the mouth and coming out the abdominal wall where your puncture is. Advance the catheter and then pull it down to the stomach. Here you're pulling it into the stomach. Here it is in the stomach, contrast injection, lateral view, beautiful, nice bolster. You can see the stomach wall is opposed to the anterior abdominal wall. So that's a, a fabulous position. And here's what it looks like at the end of it. So again, these, these are really, really great tubes. This is a great technique. And although it looks a bit complicated, it, it's really pretty easy to do. And again, I, I recommend that you try it. And the more you try it, the more proficient at it you're going to become. And as I say, if you need to feed into the genome, there are special J-tube extensions that you can add. So just like you normally would get into the genome, do that, and then add your, your uh, extension. So complications, standard complications as you'd expect, hemorrhage, uh, 0.07 here. I can't remember the time I've ever seen significant hemorrhage following a percutaneous feeding tube. Uh, infection, peritonitis, still a gastrochitin. So again, it's all about technique. Be sure the patient's NPO. Uh, be sure the gastric wall is opposed to the anterior abdominal wall and uh, your risk of peritonitis should be fairly low. All right, so chronic complications, tube obstruction. So, you know, when I talk to patients and get consent, the most common complications are these chronic, you know, complications in, in quotes. Uh, you know, the tube gets obstructed with pills or food, the tube gets uh, accidentally dislodged, or the patient pulls it out, local skin breakdown or cellulitis, and then the potential for aspiration. Uh, all right, so here is a PEG to another quiz. So find someone to answer this. So here's the PEG tube in place, and the general extension has been placed. Um, but now the, it's not possible to infuse the feeds. So what do you think is going on, or what would you do? So I think the tube is occluded. Occluded with what? Is Sorry? the tube kinked? There's a place like it's the tube. Very good. So there's two problems. So the tube is kind of coiled up in the stomach, which is fundus, which is a bit less of a problem. But the big problem here is the tube is kinked in the uh, the DJ flexor. <laughs> and so, yeah, so the tube will be obstructed. And then you just reposition. Very good. So tube obstruction is is common, and you know many patients are on a variety of medication that sometimes require pills. So I instruct the family crush the pills really well, flush very vigorously with saline or water after each feed. I sometimes use Coca Cola. Uh, people use Codesign uh, capsules to help dissolve material in tubes. Um, so th this is one of the most common problems we see and, and often requires tube replacement. Um, so, you know, the first thing you do, I, uh, the knee jerk re reaction is the tube's plugged. So I'm just gonna take, grab a syringe and I'm gonna unplug it, I'm gonna flush it with a syringe. So I'm gonna suggest don't use a syringe smaller than 20 cc's. Why would that be? I can't hear you. The tube less than 20 cc would be like, uh, would go like low pressure since. Okay, so I say that again less than 20 cc's. What's the pressure? So. In this case, since you have uh, a tube which is uh, 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 like 12 up to 20 gauge, so the smaller tube, I think, uh, will be with low pressure. 
Right. So what what generates more pressure, a 20 cc syringe or a 5 cc syringe? 5 cc syringe. Right. So it's just like when you're inflating an angioplasty balloon. So you just like you don't use a 5 cc syringe to invade an, inflate an angioplasty balloon because you can rupture it. So if you use a 5 or a 10 cc syringe, you are with an obstructed feeding tube, you are more likely to rupture the tube than you will uh, clear the obstruction. So yes, very good. It's all about thinking of the pressures that are generated by the devices we use. So sometimes patients will call me and say, oh, you know, I'm vomiting, I've got a problem. That's typically, other than the first case I showed you when the balloon was obstructing the, the duodenum, typically there's some other problem. And, and so the patient should have a formal upper GI series or endoscopy or a CT scan to look for causes of vomiting. So typically we recommend replacing these tubes every three to six months. Uh, often they'll have to be replaced earlier, as I say, the balloons, uh, the balloons do rupture. And PEG tubes don't need to be routinely changed. In fact, they're really kind of difficult to routinely change because of the big bolster. You can't percutaneously get a new PEG tube in because you can't get a new bolster. So if a, if a PEG tube breaks, you know, the holes do come in and get into them and, and they can be problems. When you exchange it, you'll need to put it in one of the standard silicone tubes. So the next problem after, uh, after obstruction is inadvertent removal. So, you know, typical thing. So your family, if someone will call you and say, oh, you know, dad's got a tube, it fell out an hour ago, it fell, fell out yesterday. So what are you supposed to do? The patient you know, the patient will often come to emerge. So, you know, patients often need feeds. Is this an emergency? And who can replace a tube? So I'm going to say virtually anyone, although our, our emerge guys aren't too good at, at replacing tubes, but if a tube's been in for more than six weeks, usually there's a pretty good endothelialized tract. And you can usually, just like when a tube falls out of the kidney or the biliary tree, you can usually get back in using catheters and wires and contrast even after a couple of days. So replacement of a tube is not an emergency, um, but it is important to try and get to it as, as soon as you can. And usually you can get back in without having to start all again. All right, so here's a patient who developed pain 24 hours after a G2. I mean, so what, uh, what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Did you answer? So the tube appears to be outside the stomach. Stomach lumen. Yeah. Very good. So first of all, there's free air. So, uh, you know, doctors will call me all the time. Oh, look, Mr. Smith's got free air after you put his tube in. So are you worried about that? Yes, that's shows that there's new operations. So are you are you worried that there's there's a problem and this patient needs an operation or a CAT scan or something? Well, I would assess the patient clinically though to see how the patient is. Okay, so yes, that's a great answer. But the 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 other real and I mean the other second part of the answer is so this is an an not unexpected finding. I mean you put a hole into the stomach, the stomach often leaks a little bit of air. So a bit of free interperitoneal gas after a G2 placement is not unusual, but you're right. I mean, if the patient's got exquisite peritonitis or leukocytosis, then you've got to be worried that maybe there's a leak or some other problem. Here is, you did very correctly identify the stomach. Here's the stomach and it does look like the tube is at least part of its course is outside of the stomach. Um, so that's important. So here's uh, a different patient actually. So here's a bit of free air uh, after feeding tube placement. Here is a, a balloon retention catheter you can see nicely inflated within the stomach. So this is a not unexpected finding after G2 placement. Uh, what about this severe pain with feeding? What would you do now? Two turns. 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 Two turns.
So what we need to look like the the big tail is out, like it's uncoiled. Yeah, so the pigtail is, is uncoiled, which doesn't necessarily mean it's out. But again, if you look at the, you know, you can't really see the stomach too well here, but this just doesn't look normal. But the, the most important thing is, is that you really can't tell where the tube is without a sign of them, without injecting contrast. So, you know, we've, um, you know, I've finally convinced my emerge guys or my hospitalists on the floor their first thing to do is when they, there's a problem, they just order an abdominal, a plain abdominal radiograph, which as I say, is pretty much useless to, to definitively describe where the tube is. So we actually have a system now. So instead of involving, you know, taking up our room time in, a, in an angio room is, we just bring them to one of the regular x-ray rooms. Our technologist will just inject 15 cc's of contrast and then obtain an abdominal radiograph and then easily identify where the tube is. And you know, in this case, it's obviously partially dislodged and it would need to be replaced. So here's a case, uh, clinical peritonitis. So here's fluid present within the, the peritoneum. And as I say, I mean, I've, I've been a witness in, in cases where tubes have been inadvertently placed into the peritoneum, patients have been fed and, and people do die from this. So, it is absolutely critical to be sure you know where the tube is and that it's in the stomach. Um, all right, so we've talked about this. So skin fixation, again, I know we've talked about skin fixation uh, with you guys before. We don't like using sutures to suture the tubes in, but sometimes that may be the answer, you know, for demented uh, cooperative patients, you know, we may need to uh, restrain them or a little, if we put, these, these kind of mitts on patients to avoid them from pulling out. And in situations with the peg tube, it's harder to pull out. If the J-tube extension gets out, gets pulled out, clearly that's not an emergency. We can just put it back anytime. Uh, just think. Okay, here's another what's wrong. So here again, you can see, you know, it's kind of either coiled in the stomach or more likely outside of the stomach. So it's a very long intraperitoneal path which again promotes uh, gastric leakage and, and peritonitis. We want to have the stomach wall opposed against the anterior abdominal wall. So that tube should be replaced. So skin breakdown is a big problem. So the gastric secretions are highly acidic and cause breakdown. Keep the skin dry, use barrier creams, diaper creams, those kind of zinc oxide white really thick creams are really important to, to protect the skin from breakdown. A common problem in, in some people for a variety of reasons, there just is a lot of pericatheter leakage that can be difficult or impossible to avoid. So the standard uh, request I get is, oh, there's leakage around the catheter. Let's just put a larger catheter in to seal the hole and stop the leakage. leakage. That really actually doesn't work. That just ends up with getting a, a larger local hole. So uh, try and avoid that. So here's a pretty ugly looking case, erythema, lots of infection, a big hole. So again, how would you treat this? So sometimes you, know, you may need to recite it, but you know, local skin care, antibiotic skin care, uh, sometimes you need a plastic surgeon, but uh, with some luck, the idea is to avoid this from happening because once you get here, it, it can be difficult to deal with. Um, tumor seeding, which is interesting, is actually uh, a case report of squamous cell carcinoma that developed at the site of a pull peg that was pulled through a tumor. So we usually don't like doing these pull pegs in patients with head and neck neoplasm. Duodenal stents. Uh, and it allows patients to eat. So you know, gastric outlet obstruction, pancreatic cancer, other local unacceptable tumors. So these patients get, uh, you know, vomiting as well. And so the advantage of a stent is it decompresses the stomach and allows feeding. So there are other alternatives, NG tube decompressing tubes, surgical bypass, which you don't want to do in someone with advanced malignancy. 
Instincts have been used, you know, back uh, you know, 20 years or so ago with, with great success. So it's really like placing a nasojejunal tube. Uh, one little tip is I find that the stomach in these patients can be quite dilated and it can be very difficult then to uh, access the, the, the duodenum because the path is long and tortuous. You often need very long guide wires, uh, which is important to have around stiff, long guide wires. And another uh, option, instead of using the per oral route, is, is just do a, either a transhepatic, which is a little bit aggressive, or a transgastric, because then that really shortens the access route and it gives you much more control. So that's a great uh, way to place these stents. So here's a patient with uh, obstruction. You can see they've got a billary, plastic billary stent in place. And uh, here is the stent in position. So these are our great techniques. Again, you should always think about, you know, someone, when someone asks you to place a G tube or GJ tube in someone with pancreatic cancer, think about, you know, look at the anatomy, look at the CT and think about placing a stent. So that was a, uh, a long walk through all that is enteric feeding. Uh, so hopefully you understand that these tubes are easy and safe to insert and well tolerated and uh, radiologists are really well suited to placing these. There are a variety of, of options in terms of where to feed the patient. And so you need to kind of look at the patient and, and think about in each individual patient, which is the, the best place to have the tube placed. Tube maintenance is, maintenance is essential. You, know, you need to teach the patient and the other physicians about what to, uh, how to identify issues, how to avoid issues, and how to contact you, and how to, how to fix the problem. So a couple of quick quizzes here. So here's a sinogram performed immediately after placing a G-tube. So look at the sinogram. So is it okay to feed the patient? Should you call surgery? Should you do a CAT scan? Should you consult GI? Or should you remove the tube and start again? Any volunteers? I would do a CT. Why, why would you do a CT? Um, because I think I see contrast outlining what looks like the colon towards the bundles of the stomach. Okay, so you're right. So you see contrast here, which is not in the stomach, but it's, it's, it's not in the colon. So, you know, again, you need to sort of be confident with your, your diagnosis. So you don't really need a CT because you've got the information here. You know, you know that this tube is not in the right place. So I just remove this tube and start again. Okay. But the important thing is that you notice. And again, as you're doing any procedure, you're always looking, am I where I think I am? Where am I? Am, am I seeing anything unusual or unexpected? Because you need to identify a potential complication before it becomes worse, so to speak. All right, so fluoroscopic placement of a, for a G-tube. So here's the G-tube, here's the kind of skin marker. So now what would you do now? Uh, place a 21 gauge Chiba and place a G-tube, use an 18 gauge trocar and place a GJ tube or send the patient home and have a nap. <laughs> Are you using a 21G2 and place a G2? You place a G2? Okay. Anyone else? Where would you place a G2? So here's, this, here's the colon, here's the stomach. And in fact, although I didn't exactly say it, this is a skin, you know, just a, a, a marker that I put. This is right up on, on the costal margin. So right above here are ribs. So I don't have direct access. So here now we've inflated the stomach and there's still a long tract here. So yes, in this case, you could advance your needle here, enter the stomach here, 
but you're going to have, as I said before, a long intraperitoneal tract. And I think that you're asking for peritoneal spill and peritonitis and problems. So I personally would not place a feeding tube. I would, I would go home and have a nap. So, you know, it, it's a bit of a problem because a patient needs feeding. So depending on what else is going on, I would consider in this case, which is unusual to suggest, I would consider a surgical uh, gastrostomy tube or a surgical gastrostomy tube. All right, so that is uh, that is it. I don't have a washer. I, I think I'm probably at the end. Are there any questions? Okay. Anybody's question? I think anybody with questions. I think nobody's questions. So thank you, Dr. Mari with a good exciting uh, talk. I think uh, every fellow has enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. So we hope more and more learning points right. from you. Well, you're welcome. I look forward to hearing about a case that you you uh, do. So please, please send me a picture. Please send me a note. Let me know when you place a feeding tube or place a stent. And of course, as always, anytime you've got any questions, you know, reach out on WhatsApp and I'm certainly happy to, to guide you or answer questions or help you. Okay, no problem. So, uh, you, you guys have a great day. I know you've got another meeting coming up, so enjoy that. And uh, it's great seeing you all. Bye. Bye-bye.